good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program with artists Nathaniel Mary Quinn and Donna Augustine Quinn. I'm Joanne Heiler, founding director of the Broad Museum. For so many reasons, I am excited about our program this afternoon. It falls on opening day of our new collection exhibition, since unveiling Acquisitions of a Decade, which is on view in our first floor galleries, highlighting our growing collection. Two wonderful works by Nathaniel Mary Quinn will stop you in your tracks midway through the show with their profound emotional currency, material richness, and depth. The galleries are all open until 5 p.m., so I hope if you haven't seen the exhibition already uh, before today's conversation, that enriched with today's conversation, you'll go downstairs and see the show and see uh, Quinn's work. Um, I'm also just so elated that this program marks the relaunch of our unprivate collection live talk series. We started this series back in 2013, featuring collection artists in dialogue with cultural leaders. It's a long lasting cornerstone of our public programs and it is so good to have it back. Thank you. It's so good to see all your beautiful vaccinated selves here live in person in this room. That is no shade to our live stream audience. Um, we love you too. Um, as a cultural institution, we fulfill our mission by inspiring conversation in the galleries among our visitors and in programs like this. This is what it's all about art as a relevant and essential part of our lives. As many of you know, our program originally included Arthur Lewis. However, Arthur was unexpectedly unable to join us. Nonetheless, we are all in for a very special program because it includes someone who knows Quinn just a bit better than almost anybody else, and that is his accomplished wife, Donna. Uh, Donna is a British-born actress director, writer, and producer, and she and Quinn live in Brooklyn, New York. She has successfully produced a critically acclaimed theater play called Shoot to Win and two comedic web series, the show for the BBC and YouTube show Dirty Laundry. Her first short film, Magpie Sings the Blues, became an official selection at London's Black Urban Film Festival in 2014. After that, she wrote, directed, and starred in the short film Bodega, which screened at many film festivals, including Pan-African Film Festival right here in LA, Black Harvest Film Festival in Chicago, Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival, and HBO's American Black Film Festival in the Emerging Directors category. She's currently developing two feature films, Quinn and The Formidable Mr. Forsyth, and several TV projects. In addition, Donna continues to enjoy acting. Her recent roles include NBC's yearly comedy showcase, Netflix's It's Bruno, and Starz's new show, Hightown. Now, a few words of introduction. I know many of you know him already very well about the remarkable artist, Nathaniel Mary Quinn. Quinn's passion for drawing began at a young age while he was growing up on the south side of Chicago. His early life, promise and achievement were buffeted by profound family tragedy and loss, jarring experiences that further propelled his art. As a teen who had lost so much, including his mother, he decided to commit himself to his education, adding his mother's name, Mary, to his name, so that she would appear on all of his degrees. He received a BA in art and psychology from Wabash College, Crawfordshire, Indiana, in 2000, and an MFA from New York University in 2002. After completing his education, Quinn continued to evolve his art, and he also taught art to at-risk youth in his bed Brooklyn neighborhood. In 2013, he had an artistic breakthrough, and in a show held in the living room of the mother of one of his art students, he debuted the distinctive format of reimagined and fractured figuration that he has pursued ever since. Art world attention and critical praise began to grow from that moment, leading eventually to his current renown and the works on the walls here at the Broad, among many other great collections that contain his work. 
Um, since that 2013 breakthrough, Quinn has been expanding and refining a process in which he collects images from mass media that call out to him. He takes them out of their original cultural context and repurposes them to create emotionally and visually arresting beacons that cast light on the relationship between memory and perception. His hybrid faces and figures connect to art history, especially neo-data and realism, and also to everyday experience, alluding to the complexity and intensity of face-to-face -face encounters and the perennial search for understanding and intimacy. As Quinn himself said to our museum staff only yesterday, he works, above all, from a platform of faith. A few quick technical notes. Um, today's conversation is being streamed and recorded for the Broad's YouTube page. For our in-person and remote audiences benefit, please silence your phones. Um, also, please note that at the end of the conversation, we'll have a question and answer period that'll last roughly 20 minutes. Donna or Quinn will ask for your questions. When you have a question, please stand when you ask it. And Donna will repeat the question for the benefit of the audience, both here and those watching remotely. So with that, let's get to the generous conversation in store for us today. Please join me in a warm and gracious welcome to Quinn and Donna. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi. Okay, can we have Oh, thank you. Okay. How are we doing everyone? We good? We good? We good? Um, Q, my yeah. love. Um, this is what we're seeing here is Motorcycle Pig which you um, created in 2014. I think it was for Pace, for the Pace show, yes. right? Um, and so I want to start at the beginning. You know, uh, there, was a, there was a breakthrough in 2013 in the type of work you decided to make. And I want to know, I want you to tell me how that came about. And um, you mentioned to me today that you felt that intuition was missing from your work. So I want you to discuss that and how you came to create this newfound um, style of working in 2013. Yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> in college, I was, I was very much influenced by uh, Romare Bearden and, and his works, his collage works. And um, I found myself trying to explore that process of art making. And, uh, but the, 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 key to, the key ingredient that was missing was um, being intuitive, intuition. And so it was years later when I made the first week called, uh, first work called Charles, which is a work on paper, and um, the process that I underwent to make this work, which is in a nutshell, a process where I continuously hide the rendering or sections that I have already completed. I will hide it with construction paper, and that process went on and on and on, and then I removed the construction paper like uh, like opening, opening a present. And then before me was this work. And that was the missing ingredient, which I like to call intuition. Oh, that is uh, been, uh, the ability to, to really trust in myself and the pathway that I will undergo in making my work. Right, so you say intuition. So before that, when you were you weren't using intuition. I'm interested to know what. So you were what? It was more contrived. You were yeah, I was just. Yeah, I was, I was learning. You know, I was. Uh, I guess I was. I guess I was trying to copy a style, trying to learn, as opposed to being in a space where I can um, actively express myself through through a lens that I found to be compelling on um, the sort of works that Romero Bearden made. He was able to generate very different perspectives and viewpoints through this sort of collage style approach. Um, although I don't even consider my work collage. You know, in fact, I, it, it just, uh, 
I like to think of my work as a means of finding ways of constructing and deconstructing the components that make up one's identity along the spectrum, the rainbow-like spectrum of humanity. I think human beings look like my work. That's why people look like that to me. Complicated. Well, all people are. Yeah. I mean, no one is here <coughs> by means of a seamless pathway. Everyone is here by means of a very crude and rugged road um, because of your, I mean, we, you know, we're going through a pandemic. I mean, nobody in this room could foresee the coming of a pandemic. And it, it turned everybody's life upside down in some way, shape, or form. It even challenged your idea of your whatever superiority you thought you had. I mean, all of a sudden you came face to face with a threat that you can't even see with the naked eye. I mean, it's how fragile you really are. And, um, and then we're wearing masks, we're getting vaccinated, staying in the house, quarantined, don't want to touch things, scared to get sick, coughing, there's a weapon now, you cough, oh, you cough. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this whole thing. Don't breathe but then me. that experience will, no doubt, play a part in constructing your identity. It's going to be a part of you for the, and a part of us for the rest of our lives. No doubt about it. It's a part of our, our disposition. So, okay, this is true, and this is what you're specifically interested in when you make your art, is just going, seeing what's behind, what's inside, right? Yeah, the essence. Right, so yes. Echo Ishan spoke about this, the curator um, from the National Museum in London. He spoke about this in your Gagosian Premier's um, film that's up right now, and he spoke about your, um, this idea that you're investigating the interior your human experience through your work. That's what, you're, that's what you're trying to investigate, right? To say that we're all sort of seamless? Yes. We're not, no, we're we're not, not sorry, we're, we're not, not seamless. seamless. We're, all we're all similar, that's what I meant. Sorry. Well, yeah, we're, we're, we're similar in our... More similar than what we think. We're, 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 we're similar in the fact that we must endure this journey. The moment you are born and the moment you take your first breath, your breath becomes your signature on your contract of death, period. Now that you're here, you go through life. And throughout life, you have a tapestry of experiences. And these experiences help to formulate your identity. And when you meet people, you can sense that with people. It's like uh, when you meet somebody for the first time. When I met you for the first time, Donna, before we spoke, yeah. I had a sense about you. I felt something about you. One thing I remember feeling. <laughs> my God, here we go. <laughs> is you were uh, a tough woman. You were a no nonsense woman. I, I mean, you didn't have to communicate that to me. I just sensed that. And 13 years later, you are no doubt a no nonsense woman. So hold on. So are you trying to? I want to paint that. That's that what I was moment that, yeah. I, that, that, right. with that unspoken moment, I'm interested in painting that. Right. I'm interested in painting the essence right. of one's humanity. I want to paint that feeling, that, that intangible substance. That is what intrigues me, because that, to me, is real. Like, right. that's like, that's not, that's not covered with any isms. It's not covered with any man-made constructs. It's not democratic or republican. It's not black or white. So when you go to make a work of art, being that's your mandate, because that's your mandate, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pursuit of an idea. Right. Yeah. So when you're going, let's talk about the actual, real process and how, because you know you use these images, right? You use photographs, magazine um, snippets from magazines. I remember once, I found this really beautiful image of this. Um, full-size model and I just I just thought she was amazing and I brought it home to you and I said look at th here's an image for you to use on a work <laughs> you looked at it and you went eh, it's boring I can't I can't paint that it's not boring it's too boring yeah. and I was like what do you mean and he said Donna I'm not interested in painting things that are boring it has to do s you, there has to be like a well, feeling I mean, yeah, it, it, which is what you're talking about yeah but well, it should, uh, well I mean you like to think when you're doing research that you will come across images as source material that can evoke a response right. or capture your interest. 
So you find those images, and this, because I think a lot of people will, would want to know this, right? Your work is not collage. Everything is created on the surface from That's hand, right. made by hand. So yeah. what? T take us through the process of actually how you... It's not a knockoff Louis Vuitton bag. It's a real yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the real thing. Yeah. So take us through that, how you actually... I know you mentioned it very sort of quickly five minutes ago, but I think people are interested in that. Yeah, uh, okay, so every work that I make starts first with a vision, like some mental picture that comes to me. And uh, I didn't have this visceral response to make, to manifest that image into physical reality. And uh, so from there, I... Um, and in the vision, I see, I pre-see everything. Like, a few things I know right away is like the size of the work, if it should be on paper versus canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see the basic form of the image, like the, if, if it's a figure or a face or whatever. I get a sense of the color palette. And it's like I can, I can sense it. It's like uh, I can taste, it's like, you know what? A steak dinner tastes like you know. I can, it, it it runs through me, and then I um, prepare the paper. I mount it onto the wall, and then I do research. So I'm looking for images that can help satisfy all of the components of that piece. It's like as though the images are being sought out to see if they will be the best fit for the job. Mm. Like 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 um. I can look at five different noses, for example, but the, the nose number three is the best fit for the job. It doesn't mean the other noses aren't good enough. It's just not good enough for this. Right. But then I keep those other images because maybe I will come back to those images again in the future. future. And then I mount the photographs. And so my vision, I never make a, uh, I never make a preliminary sketch for my work. I never do a pre-drawing. The pre-drawing is the vision. Why don't you make a pre-drawing? Because the vision is the pre-drawing. Everything comes from here. <laughs> Every, oh, my apologies. Everything comes from, from here. Can I make a point? Yes, please. Can I interject? Yes, I am. <laughs> I think you don't make a pre... I, I think it's like a, what an actor does. I don't think you make a pre-drawing because when you make a pre-drawing, it's set. Yes. And if you if you go onto the canvas or onto the paper free, it there's more you have more freedom. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That's I what we do when we learn lines. You don't yeah, learn yeah. them in a certain way by rote. Yes, because when you stand up in a in a in a room and someone throws a line at you, you want to be able to free feel free to respond in a way that's fit fitting for that moment. And I think that's that's the same with your art. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I what I would add to that too, Donna, is that also I don't do the the, well, I mean, I guess we're saying the same thing because essentially what, see, because here's the thing, like, the vision comes to me in an organic fashion, you mm -hmm. see. So to make the work, it too has to be carried out in an organic fashion. And the pre-sketch for me, I will feel like it would stifle my ability to grow. Because right. I got a, it's not a, how, how does one determine the route by which the vision comes? Well, I don't even understand this route. I just know that I have to be in the moment and be intuitive in the process. You see what I'm saying? So the, the vision, as then I broadcast onto the surface of the paper or the canvas, now I'm working through the process of like pure intuition and just having like faith, and I'm feeling my way through it. I'm not thinking, I'm feeling my way through the process. Mm -hmm. And you're working, you work, and right. you must work and toil until you can, in fact, the vision is, 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 is so, it's so sturdy, it's so solidified, that there have been times my vision demanded that I um, render something that was very complex. And I didn't want to go through it, you know. It's going to be so hard, you know. Oh, my God, this material. Oh, man. And that thought, well, let me change it for something more simple. The moment I did that, the work was bad. It didn't work. So I'm like, I got to render this blouse, you know, <laughs> or this whatever the case is. Like, these little 
intricate, annoying details, but they, they are um, necessary for the work's completion. So right. that, that's the answer to the question, yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, listen, this is 2014. This, this is motorcycle. This motorcycle, motorcycle which is an exceptional work. You know, it's one of my favorite works that you ever made, right? Um, you can, t I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna. See, my father, let me tell you something, when I was growing up, my father, my father used to, uh, my father was, a, uh, uh, he was illiterate, he couldn't read or write. Well, both of my parents were illiterate. Right. But he had odd jobs, and many of his odd jobs were, were, he would work at restaurants. And from time to time, he would bring home pig ears mm. and pig feet. And this was a big, proud moment for my father. I know. It's you like, ate this? Yeah, I ate it with my dad. <laughs> and, um, and, we, and we were living in the, the Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago, this public tenement housing. Right. And my father would bring home with pride this, what he thought to be a high-end delicacy. Because for him, that, mean, that meant something. Right. Uh, also, as a kid, I grew up like reading comic books. That's why you had the Incredible Hulk yeah. arm there. And, and, and then and we had a pantry. In the pantry, there were uh, like bike parts and motorcycle parts in the pantry. And my father cleaned that pantry out. I remember him moving these motorcycle parts out the pantry, and he turned into my little art studio. And he would hang my comic books up as inspiration. He found an old wooden table downstairs. He brought it upstairs, and he tilted it up wow. with books. And I, he would have me draw in there. That's motorcycle pig. See, that, that, that is where that comes from. That chair is the, the same kind of chair that my father was sitting in when he, when he um, watched televangelists on TV, you know? Because he would try to teach himself how to read when he saw the, the, the preachers right. and the words bouncing across the bottom of the screen. He, he sat in a chair like this. And my father was a great big man, you know? Is that why you have the apes feet? Yeah, because he, but, well, my father, to me, he had the intelligence equivalent to an I mean, he, he ah, couldn't read. Wow. But of course, his intelligence in the body of an, uh, a, a monkey or ape is considered like hugely smart. I mean, they are very smart, no doubt about it. But you know, I, just, I always found that correlation to be interesting to me, you know? Right. And, um, and then hair, that's the hairstyle my mom wore. And that hair is at the crown of the piece, because my mother was the crown of the home. Like everything stopped and began with her. So it's fascinating, right? Because Jesus, when you when you make the work, you're not thinking all of this. No, right? no, no. The work tells me what it is. But so that means that on some level, on something, in some sort of spiritual way, right? Yes. You're, work, you're you're working a lot with spirituality, right? Because you're invoking something from like you were like you were what? Jesus, the, it's, it's, Ten it's, or something. Yeah, was, all these things were happening when you were very young, but you. And you, you know, you mind this when you're much older. So talk to me about spirituality. My art gives me the opportunity to recreate various aspects of the family that I so desperately miss. Mm. I get to recreate them again. And I get to re recreate a family I wish I had. See what I'm saying? That's why it's Nathaniel Mary Quinn. When I was coming up, nobody cared about my mother. Now they must say her name to address me. You know, it's beautiful. So that that all the all the work, but also 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 on the other hand, but it's quite spiritual. Do you know what I mean? All, it is spiritual, but also what's radical about it is I'm able to try to communicate the idea of acceptable humanity through people who, in real life, yeah, no one cared about, right. and they too meant something. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to communicate the the the, the breath and the beauty of humanity through people who were once deemed less than great. But it's coming through that, through that work. Mm. And then hopefully when people look at the work, they look at a reflection of themselves. You too look just like this. It's not right. just about my dad, it's just about people at large. So can I have um, image number three, guys? Okay, so moving on to this, Gorgeous work, gorgeous. Like, how many people wanted this work? Um, Buck, Nasty, play a hater. Hater's play a hater's ball. ball. I'm yes, just getting there. So here's the thing, right? So we see in your work this constant growth. I mean, really, I mean, you know, me and Ashley, I, don't, I can't see her, there she is. We talk about this 
my left arm in the art world, um, Ashley from Gagosian. Um, and we talk about this. So we even look at, so we're talking two, I mean, that is a bit of a skip, 2014. We're talking about three years later, right? But here's the thing. From, if we look at from the beginning, right, to even, to, to even this, which is like just, it's just a spectacular work, right? Um, there's this constant pushing, this constant growth, this constant kind of need to kind of be better, which is what you say to me, like, mm. you know, I'll come downstairs at three in the morning and be like, what's going on? And have a look and be like, oh, that's good, babe. Oh, did we do that? Change that. And you'll be like, it's great. Or it's not great. You don't think it's great? But there's this constant need to push and be better. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that comes from? It, do you think it's from, from, from your boarding school? Do you think it's something that you're... It's, it's, it's quite, it's un literally, you are obsessed with being better and you always say to me, you know, one day I'll make a really great work of art. And I'm like, you've made quite a lot, babes. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And you're like, they're, o they're okay. You always say, hold on, I want to say this. You always say to me, they're okay and I can do better. Mm -hmm. But where does that come from? I'm, I'm always intrigued by it. Well, I'll tell you what, I have... I, I mean, you know, I'm just... The, in this work right here, for example, the, the hat is borrowed from a portrait of Rembrandt. That's right. Um, and I re, you know, of course, we appropriate it into this work in mm -hmm. this context. But to answer your question, you, you know something? I, for me, I think in life, everyone has to have a why, a good enough why. Why, you, why is that you do what you do? Like, why? Mm. And it has to be a why that is potent. It does. That, is, um, that carries great significance for you. Absolutely. And I am on a quest to someday create a work of art of my mother that is so potent mm. that she will walk off the surface of that canvas of paper back into my physical life. This is why I must get better. So I can make that work. That's my why. I know it's your why. That's why I work. That's it. Simple as that. These works are nothing more than just sketches, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> this is preparing me to make that work because I miss my mother. I'm just keeping. I, I really. I, I think of my mother all the time. I miss that woman, and she she helped me to believe in something. And that's why when I talk about my work, I try to talk about my work in a in a way that's honest. So I can be vulnerable because I'm a vulnerable person and I'm not afraid of it. I'm not going to hide behind a lot of intellectual talk or deep philosophy. It ain't about that. When I'm in my studio, I'm wrestling with me. I'm not wrestling with Foucault or Derrida. I'm wrestling with me. Yeah, but also all great artists, writers, directors, all, all, all creatives, right? It's, it's, with you, it's, it's a war with yourself. Yes. Right, so to that point, your work ethic is sick. Like, yo, you, you know how. It, like, I've just the gift of Quinn for me is just what you've taught me about being great for Donna. Right, the ten I get, a, I get a grade when I when Quinn puts me on tape for an audition. He gives me a mark out of ten for the audition. Yes, every time. I do grade you. That's an A. That's an eight out of ten, and and you have you know you, t you he has this whole philosophy about this idea of most people in life do things to six to seven. He said every other actor is producing tape right now that's six or seven out of ten. That's what you said to mm -hmm. me. He said you must produce work that is nine out of ten, and if you are not producing work that's ni nine out of ten, you are not competing, right? That's right. So you always push me to be great, and t you taught me about scheduling and just completely like just going for gold, right? So I want any other artist, and I mean artists in all senses, right? Not just, not just um, painters, directors, any, any person in here who, who is an artist of any form, what would you say about the, because I think that we, as creators, we get a bit lost in that, right? Because mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have a schedule. When you have a job, you have a schedule. Someone tells you what to do. Mm -hmm. As a creative, you have, you have to create your own schedule, which you do. So I want you to talk about that a bit because I think it's really powerful. Well, yeah, I think it's important to have a schedule. I think it's important to be, um, to be disciplined. And discipline means you do it even when you don't feel like doing it. You must do it. it, should, it should be, you should require that of yourself because otherwise all you have are a bunch of broken promises that you've made to yourself. 
and you're only letting yourself down. And then you're just left with a bunch of excuses that you created. It's on you. So I believe that you should be disciplined, um, set a schedule, and you report to it every day, and you do Talk it. about your schedule. So my schedule is this. When I get ready for a show, I, I, I start in the studio at 11 o'clock, and then I work from 11 to 3 p.m. I take a 15-minute break. Then from 3.15 to 8, I work. So it's like five-hour five hour block. I take another 15-minute break at 8 to 8.15. Then from 8.15 to midnight, I work again. Another, so it's three five-hour blocks. Now, on the other hand, in my studio, I have a chart that I've created, and the chart has seven slots, and each slot has the first letter of the day of the week, M for Monday, T for Tuesday. And then in, in each slot, I put a piece of paper in there, and each, so every Sunday, I fill out the slots with the pieces of paper. So when I come in the studio on Monday, I pull out the paper for Monday, I read it, and each paper has three items. So it says one, complete nose, two, start hat, three, start background. And that's it, that's what I do for the day. Now, if I get that done by midnight, I'm done. But I don't leave until it's done. So if that means on many nights I work till 3 o'clock in the morning, I just don't leave until the goals are met. Because I am not going to break a promise with me. I'm not doing that. That, to me, is mediocrity at its best. And I can't, I can't stomach that. You know what I mean? Because if I want to be better, you must do this. This is what, this is, what is required to improve. <laughs> and I, I, I got to see my mother again. It's very important for me to stick yeah. to that schedule. Yeah. OK. So you obsessively read. You obsessively listen to podcasts. You're ve you ingest a lot of things in the world. You're very obsessive. You watch films, TV shows. You, you ingest a lot of other creativities, right? You, mm -hmm. you read books. You read, you, read play, you read everything. You listen to everything. You're very obsessive in your mm -hmm. downtime, like in, and then reporting to me, like spitting it all out. Yeah, I like to share these things. So he shares. He shares. Yeah. The other day, I was like, all right, you've said that one four times. He was like, I feel good. I've got someone I can talk to about these things. I was like, my wife and I, I would don't take, feel good about it. We take, we take morning walks every morning together, and I always share it. Oh, guess what I learned? I learned this. And I talk her head off. She, my wife enjoys spending time with me, though. She loves it. <laughs> she, she enjoys it. But hold on, I've got a am point. I right? Am I right? Yes, baby, you're right. You're right. right. All right, right. calm down. So hold on. I love being around <laughs> she, can't, she can't wait to wake up in the morning and hang out with me. <laughs> but hold on, I want to make a point. I want to. I want to know whether my acting coach, Maggie Fanagan in, in New York, really believed that all art in has, has um, influence, all art influences other art. That's she, true. She was, ob she was like, go yeah. to the opera. Don't just be an actor reading plays. Go to the opera, go to art. Guys. She really believed in the power of that. And you kind of touched on it again in the mm. Gagosian premieres thing when you were talking to, to Raphael Sadiq. Yeah. And you said, you see that bit right there? Yeah. That's that song. And then you started yeah, yeah, to yeah, sing yeah, a song yeah. from one of his famous acts. Yeah. And he was like, woo, he was blown away, right? Yeah. So I just want to talk a little bit about that idea that how other art is infected is impacting your art, is impacting yeah, your I, work. Yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, I do, I believe that um, art is, a, I, I think that it's important to understand that you ought to allow yourself to be influenced by other traditions of art making, for right. sure. You know, I mean, listen, I, I am, for example, a very huge fan of John Curran, a great painter, mm -hmm. or, or Jeannie Savile, or, or Jacob Lawrence, of course, but I also want to make art that's, as good as Red Fox or Dave Chappelle, you know, as good as uh, Leonardo DiCaprio or, or Steven Spielberg as a director or, you know, Aldous Huxley as an author, you know, James Baldwin. I, I'm informed by all of those great works. I watch clips on YouTube of like great athletes like uh, Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant and just the clips. And Jenny Savile and I talked about this, how we, her and I both, are informed by the last dance. Like, and we, and you know what take us about him? His work ethic. And we are moved and inspired by his work ethic. 
And J.D. Savile, big deal artist, one, I mean, really one of the greatest painters living today in the world. And her and I have that, we share that sentiment. And this is Michael Jordan, he's a basketball player. This guy probably never made a drawing day in his life, but he's an artist on that basketball court. And we are inspired by that. All, all traditions of art making ought to be allowed to inspire that which you do. You find greatness in, in, in anything you look at. Mm -hmm. So, you're a real student of the game. I think you're a real, I mean, you are a true, you know, you really, 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 I mean, you've got loads of books, Lucian Freud, um, who's the, Adrian Guinea, you know, you, yeah. you're like, a, you're obsessively um, reading, buying books on other artists, looking at their work, and you, you go up to them, and you, you know, we have, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you're a student, you're studying even now, you left NYU 20 years ago, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, which movements uh, have inspired you, and, or which art? I mean, you spoke about a few today, but uh, are Ooh. there some, some like cubism, surrealism? You know, which yeah, movements? Yeah, I don't. Have, it, well, have that's, really that's that's a um, that's a tough question. I'm not sure. You think artists that have inspired you more? Uh, I think individual artists. Than the, than Jim that. Dine, right? Jim Dine was, and, and um, Romare Bearden. I mean, those are two artists specifically speaking. Jim Dine, um, he made these beautiful drawings of his studio tools, mm -hmm. like uh, brushes and hammers. And um, I, I remember when I first came to New York, a good friend of mine, William Villalongo, we were in some small group show together, and Will and I started talking, and I started w waxing poetic about Jim Dine to him. He said, man, he said, Man, you're the first black man I was met. He <laughs> <laughs> went on about Jim Dye. <laughs> I thought that was so, that tickled me so, but, um, <laughs> but he's a remarkable draft person, and um, the way he was able to uh, ascertain this sort of fragility in the, in the weight of the line that he placed on the paper, mm -hmm. I was, um, that captivated me, that stayed with me, you know? Um, but then, of course, Romero Bearden, I mean, this guy is like, you know, I could, he's the Picasso of black artists to me, you know, like, um, he's, he's, he's like a, this remarkable collage. So, I, 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 yeah, I say artists in particular. More than movements. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a movement. But, but, but cubism is in there, babe. Well, you know, I think what happens is when you study, um, art history and stuff, like, these things can still find a way to come Flash through you. Through you. I think also because of my love for film, a lot of my works has a film-like quality to them. Absolutely. You know, because uh, I love films and movies. I like the way films look. You know, I like the graininess of it. You know, like this work was from an episode of, of the Dave Chappelle, Chappelle Show. show. <laughs> and the, uh, um, Eddie Murphy's brother, Oh, play the Char character called Charlie Murphy. Buck, oh. Yeah, Buck Nasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> play and they, they play hands, hands play play This is that. This is from that. Right. And uh, I watch it over and over again. And he said that like really uh, amazing joke. Um, I can't remember. And that's a shame. I can't remember the joke. But you know something. I, I made this work. And then I think a year after making this work, he passed away. He, he passed away, That's and right. then I, I went to see Dave Chappelle at Radio City Music Hall. Mm -hmm. and remember, they invited me to the party. I met Dave, yeah. and Dave and I talked for like an hour. I showed him this piece. And then Dave started to talk a lot about his time with Charlie Murphy. Oh. And me and Dave, we spoke for like, yeah, like an hour, man. This, this from his work. Because I said, Dave made this work, man. Influence. Well, that whole yeah. show was called um, Nothing's Funny. Yeah, it's about, it's about it's all my about love for comedy. Yeah. So there you have it, right? Film, comedy, mm. artists, right. visual artists, all going right. through my work, you know? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I did not set out to make this. I had a vision for a work. Right. And when the work was done, it said to me, Buck Nasty, play his <laughs> I said, that's exactly it. Can I have um, image number one? We're gonna have a look at the work that's actually in the broad collection. And you can talk a little bit about these beautiful works that yes. were in 2019 solo exhibition at Gagosia in Los Angeles. Great show. Ugh, gorgeous show. Again, 
look at the, the, the that, that's 2017 to 2019, right? So here, you started to play with abstraction. Yes, I did. You really did start to lean into abstraction. You became very obsessed with lovely um, Adrian Guinea and um, there was a few other Well, guys. you know, I became, I became, I, well, well, look, I look at um, the, the works by the artist, the Chinese contemporary painter, Lu Zhaodong. Zhao 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 Zhao, yeah. Of course, Adrian Guinea and um, Lucian Freud, mm -hmm. Vermeer. I mean, I vacillate from present to past, and I'm always on the, I, I keep pages open on my phone to go back and look, and I got Lou Zaldan's book on the table and looking at all these beautiful portraits that he makes of like everyday people mm -hmm. um, all, around, all around the world, and um, you know. Well, I, I, I felt, uh, the thing about me is that I get to a point where I feel like I need to grow. I, when, when, that, when that thought, when I get that, that thought that I need to grow, I need to mature, it's almost impossible for me to stay in the same place. But here's a question. That's why the, ab, the interest in abstraction start to uh, come into my right. practice, yeah. So here's a question, though. Is that because, does that happen because you feel that you're, you know, like when you go to the gym and you, oh, I can do five miles, it's nothing now. So now you've got, is it because something happens where you become a bit bored or you've kind of just outgrown the position you're in right in, in making your, in your practice in that moment so you feel you got to, so you don't lay in your laurels? Is that the reason? Well, I think the reason is that is because um, as an artist, well, look, my art practice is about how I collaborate with my materials. Yeah. It's yes. all about the materials and how, and the more I collaborate with my materials, the more exploration that's being done. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the work. And then you start to understand all the other things that may be possible with your mm -hmm. materials. In which case, I'm talking about black charcoal, gouache, soft pastel, oil pastel, oil paint, mm -hmm. you know, on paper or canvas. So I'm always like, and I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, I know that I'm just touching the surface of it. I know it. I feel it. I have such a long way to go. I really do. And, and because there's so many magical things that I could achieve with those materials and how well, look, it's like, it's like we've been together for 13 years. Now, when I first met you, it was, it was beautiful. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> no. That's cold. That's real cold. That's cold. That's real cold. <laughs> now I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But here's the thing, Donna. When we first met each other, we went on dates, we went to movies. But this is like with art, you know, as time progressed and we explored more with each other. We begin to blend our dreams, our hopes. Absolutely. We start to support one another. We start to learn how to do that. You know, I start to understand what you like, what you don't like, mm. what you want to do. I start to, it be, be, became more intimate, you see, just over time. Mm. Now, here's the thing, Donna. It's so beautiful now. After all these years, you and I taking a morning walk is a moment that far surpasses most people's uh, big old birthday splash. You know, we have more fun than them. We have more. We have more peace than they are. Just taking a walk don't cost one red cent because we just together in a different kind of spiritual place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So that's that's the best way I can to, to share to describe the art practice and you know working with the materials and exploring the materials and, and this is why the maybe you can detect the growth yeah you know? but but also I do you know we have this conversation about um, the talent right the, the just there's an, there's just an innate talent that some people have but then with you because you're constantly pushing you're pushing the talent right you're you're extending it well what Does that make sense? Well, what's happening is this this is, what, this is what I believe. I think what happens is that you, you, you work very hard to, to, to contain a, um, a solid grasp over the fundamentals. 
you know, like skills, right? The skills. Like right. you, you know, you understand that, mm -hmm. and you, you make sure your skill set is like so proficient that then that will allow for the expression. Yes. Of who you are. Yes. You know, like like Kobe Bryant, his his understanding of the fundamentals of the game was was so proficient that when he got on that court, he was able to fully and thoroughly express himself on the court. Yep. Because he knew the fundamentals to a T. Right. It was locked in. Got and it. I think that, but that requires a tremendous amount of work. You understand? And that's why I constantly work push in the myself. studio and push myself and explore these materials. Because yeah. I, gotta, I gotta have respect for the black charcoal and the soft pastels too. You know, like we are in a relationship. We are collaborating. Right. It's not me having dominion over the materials, but there's no hierarchy. We are on the same. And the materials are telling me, Quinn, use me this way. Try to use me like this. But that's intuition, no? Yeah, but you gotta have respect. And when you when I say respect for the materials, then you realize that you and the materials originate from the same beginnings. You're getting and, deep now. Huh? Because you're getting deep now. No, 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 it's true. From dust we came into dust oh we shall return. <laughs> I waited three years to drop that one. From uh, dust we came <laughs> to dust we shall Dude. return. Dude. <laughs> now that's a lie from Denzel Washington. Right there. <laughs> so let's talk about this this lovely so work. So this work is uh, of course called pure insecurity. insecurity. And you know, in essence, the work is no doubt a reflection of how I do often feel about my practice. I'm, I am no doubt deeply insecure about my work. In fact, I think with my growing success, I've become even more insecure about my practice. But that's a positive, because what it does is it makes you push yourself, because you're always trying to be better, because you feel insecure. It's like this, it's yeah. this little circle. Yeah, right? yes, right, yeah. yeah. And then I guess some people would say that if you are not, apparently before Beyonce goes on stage, she's nervous, believe it or not. You're like, she's ridiculous, right? But apparently <laughs> if you... If you get to the, some people say if you get to the place where you're like, oh, I've got this, it's a problem. There's a problem. Mm -mm -mm, that's not a good place for oh, any oh, artist to be. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we have image number two? So, yeah, maybe would you say, well, I would say, I think nah, it's yeah, a, yeah, 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 there's something mean. about that, right? You can't yeah. just sit in this place of like, oh, I got this, I'm hot. Yeah. Because then, no, 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 then I, you stay, stay stagnant, no? Well, I mean, well, that's why I think it's important to have a very good why. You know, like, your, a why, whatever, whatever drives you to do what it is that you want to do, mm -hmm. it should, it should be something that um, transcends like mm -hmm. the material world. Of course. And That's whatever accolades that you may receive here. or. It has to come from here. Yeah. Can't be here. Yeah, yeah. It has to, it has to transcend all of that. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and I think um, it's also very, very important to um, sustain gratitude. Gratitude is what helps you to sustain humility. Mm. And being humble is very, very key. And that humility is what allows me to grasp on to my why. Right. You know what I mean? Because the why reminds me of my humanity. Right. That's why I treat people with respect and love, as you know, in, yeah. the in Brooklyn and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, I, if I claim, if I make such a claim about my art practice, then I ought to live that way in my life. When I connect with people, yeah. you know, and, and treat people with respect and love, mm -hmm. and, and bring about peace. I you was going to ask you about this because, you know, from the beginning, you've always really helped people. Yeah. On your whole rise, you've helped so many other, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's, I mean I'm the same, right? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm at some rise, but I'm just making a point that I always try to help if people ask me for something. Oh, do you know a good coach? Or do you know, you know, somebody who does great Shakespeare classes? I'm, you know, or, you know, actors have often asked me to coach a scene in Caribbean accent, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, why don't you charge them? I'm like, I'm not charging them, they're actors. Yeah. We're, we're all broke, you know, I'm not charging. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I just do it and I put it down on tape for them, right? So you've always helped other artists. Derek Forger, you helped usually. 
Ark Niles, all of who, who are very successful now yeah. in your own right, and you yes. really championed them because you took off before them. You and Hugo took off before them. Well, Derek and I just and, had a number of conversations. Right, I wouldn't say I exactly helped them, but all right. you, know, you would call them. Yes, the but, box, you so, know, yeah. on our anniversary card, he wrote a whole monologue about I wanted to cry when he wrote a whole he thing. Did? Yeah, I've got, I saved it for you. To me, yeah, he wrote this whole thing about how much how he looks up to you. and You anyway. kept that cough yourself, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so here's my question. Why is that so important to you? Because it is, like, you really do. You, you know, you have lovely Genesis. She's with, you know, she's with Almi now, and you talk to Genesis, and you used to really help, you know, you used to have all these calls with her. And, you know, I, I want to know was, why that's so important to you, because I think it's really lovely. I think it's beautiful, because you're cre actually creating a community. Yeah. So talk I, to me about that. Well, look, I, first of all, I think giving back to the community or helping people it is a radical choice to make because humans are actually wired for self-preservation. Mm. That's what humans are wired to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so to then give back and help people is a radical move from your disposition as a human being and the way you're wired. Mm -hmm. That's why most people don't give back. Or and most people don't help people. And most people are not generous. That's and that's nothing surprising about that because humans are wired that way. Mm. However, we also know that no human being exists on an island. It's not possible to get to any place that you want to get to by yourself. Somebody, or a number of somebodies who sat on the board of Culver Academies decided to give me or award me a full scholarship to go to that private one. I have never met these people a day in my life. But they, for some reason, decided to vouch for me and hand me all this money so I can go to that school. And I never met these people. There was another experience I had where I was in that school, in the lunch line, and I had jacked up teeth because you sucked my thumb as a kid. And somebody else saw me in that line and said, and never <laughs> met, and looked at my mouth and thought, hmm. <laughs> And then next thing you know, There's my a check. dorm counselor comes into my dorm and says, Nate, I say, Mr. Clinton, his name was Mr. Mr. Clinton. Clinton. I said, how you doing, Mr. C? He says, you have a dentist appointment too. I said, well, why make an appointment? <laughs> he said, you're getting braces. I said, really? I know I'm not this person. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a third example. It wasn't, it was not until years later when it dawned on me the sacrifice that Ms. Pilcher and Ms. Jackson made, him for, for yes. made, a, made for me yes. in their life. Because as a kid, when I had nowhere to go, after being abandoned by my family, after my mom died, these two educators, black educated, uh, educators, black women, both educators, who took me in, gave me refuge, gave me hope, gave me a reason to believe in the prospects of an optimistic future. Now, it wasn't until years later as a grown man, I realized those teachers put their jobs on the line for yep. me. Because they brought me to their home, they brought a, a 15, 16 year old kid to the house. Mm. You go to prison for something like that these days. Somebody yep. could accuse them of molestation. Yep. Those two women sacrificed their jobs for me. So I would be remiss not to help people, man. I have to help people. Like all the people that help me. And that's, oh. why, that's why I like to help. Now, of course, I firmly believe in that. Yeah, no, you were very generous. Because you know what, I'm telling you something else. When I walk down North Street Avenue in Bedford Stuyvesant, I look on one block, I see 10 beauty salons on the same block, all of them making money. Mm -hmm. On the same block. Like, well, I can't argue now have a full-time career then. But that four job can't take off. Let's see if I can help this artist take off. Oh, what about this one? Let me call him up. Let me call her. We all can do something. Everyone can things. eat. Everyone can eat. It's not going to take nothing out of my pocket. Yep. It's not hurting me. It's a lovely thing to see other people succeed. That's a beautiful thing in life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, because you're a doll, that's why. Um, so <laughs> it's one of the things I love about you the most because you're so kind. You know, I say that's why I married yeah. you because you're I so think, kind. I think I'm probably kind to a default at times. You know. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You're a bit silly. 
Me and Ashley can talk to that, can't we, Ashley? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got five minutes. Okay, so let's talk about Come Walk With Me. I have a question. About, yes, I want you to talk about the work. This is also in the broad. They bought two from That's that. Right from that lovely show mm -hmm. that goes in. Um, but I, so I want you to talk about the work, but I want to just speak, just do, and make it really brief, right? 2013, you only worked on paper. Yes. And then you switched. This and is work on paper too. Yes, yes my no, darling. Okay. And then you switched and slowly you started to work on, you were beavering away making work on paper. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to do that? I'm just that actually interested. On it, paper? Yeah, because you even did it on, I didn't even know you. You just one day you had a canvas in front of me and you were like, this is your work. I was like, well. Do you know what I mean? I want to know why. Why did I start working on paper? No, why you decided to start working on canvas. Oh! Because really, you're the king of work on paper. I mean, this looks like a pain, but it's on paper. It's beautiful. You're amazing on paper. Well, you know what? I, well, I mean, there are benefits to making works on, like, linen canvas. Right. Because of the texture that it gives. Okay. Um, so you just want to spread your wings? Yeah. I mean, that's essentially why. But I, well, on the other hand, I wanted to... I wanted to challenge the, the idea of painting, right? Um, and I, I thought, man, if I could find a way to broadcast this aesthetic onto the surface of, a, of canvas without feeling the pressures of having to use oil paint, ah. but it could still be a painting, right? then I could challenge the, the entire like, definition of, or canon of painting. What is a painting? Right. You know, what makes that a painting, right. exactly, you know? Right. Just like, uh, what's so chair like about a chair? What makes it a chair? <laughs> you know, we call, yeah. we call it a chair. We yeah. were conditioned to call it a chair. Yeah. If we grew up eating on top of this, this would be a table. <laughs> this would be a chair. The reality is we don't know what this is. All we know is what we've been conditioned to call it. Right. So I figure if I could put dry materials on canvas, right. it could then still be red. As a painting. And identify, categorize as a painting. Fantastic. And so what's this beautiful work about? This work is about my mother. And it's called Come On and Walk With Me. And this is a statement I imagine my mother would say to me now. Right. As she sees me from above, come on and walk with me. You know, it's like a beautiful ode to my mother. As a reflection of my mother, nonetheless. Not a portrait. I don't, I don't do portraits. Right. I try to paint the uh, reflections of people. Um, right. uh, You've made a lot yeah. of works about your mother. Uh, yes, I imagine I will continue to do that, yeah. And so your mother would wear these types of lovely hats well, that she mother, has on? Well, your mother, she was a big church-going woman, so she okay. would wear like, this, this, this is reminiscent of the type of attire she would wear to church when she went. My mother was a, a Baptist churchgoer. She went to a church on, I think it was like on 79th and Yates in Chicago. Did you go with her? Yeah, she took me to church with her like, all, all the time. Every, every week, Wednesday, Sunday school, Bible study, she sang in a choir, and she would get the Holy Ghost. I saw her get the Holy Ghost sometimes. <laughs> and I would think to myself, what in the world is she doing? What's <laughs> This can't be real. This woman acting crazy like this. And, and she was, then one time, I didn't get the Holy Ghost, but one time I pretended to get the Holy Ghost. I, I just, and I was like, and I was looking around like, and then, did you fall out? No, I didn't fall out. Oh, I have one quick question. Can I ask it, please, guys? Um, so we're having a really amazing moment, right, in the, in the art world, where there's this large influx of black artists who are killing the game. There's yeah. a large influx yeah. of people working. Yeah. You know, the industry is now taking in black curators and mm -hmm. lots of people like gorgeous, fabulous Ashley is a director at Gagosian and you yeah. know, she has a, obviously Ashley's been in the game for many years. Yeah. Um, what do you, what, how do you feel about this? You help all our, I mean most of the, well, you help all, Jonathan Podwell's white, you help, you help everyone. Yeah, you, don't you don't care, you don't care about that. But I want to know specifically how you feel about this, this moment we're having. Um, yeah, what do you think? Especially, I, th I think I think I think it's I think it's fantastic. I think it's it's a it's it's great. I think it's great because it it 
it, it, it stands to highlight the real meaning of pure competition. And um, I think a part of America is based on the idea of competing, right? And, um, and I, think it's, I think it's great. You have a lot of um, artists of color, black and brown artists, mm -hmm. who are gaining access to the art world and doing very, very well. The market is supporting their work. And a lot of these artists are making money. You know, the works are going to the collections. They are getting visibility. They're being seen, you know. Um, you know, now, now on the other hand, I, I do hope it is sustained and that it continues to, it, that, it, that it, it, it remains to be pure. You know, not just like a moment. I don't think it's going to be a moment. I think it's here to stay. I do believe right, that. Right. But, um, you know, a lot of movements throughout art history have always been upheld by political shifts. Right. And black lives so, matter. in the climate. Yeah, Black Lives Matter, therefore, there's lots of black artists. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's, that's a what, reflection. But that's, yeah. been, that's true of all various art movements, of movements, period. I mean, like in any yeah, of given field of study of artistic pursuit cool. so okay so we're going to throw it out right let's throw it out yes okay. of course if, um if anybody has any questions they want to ask quinn this is the moment <laughs> um and and please stand up so and then i'm obviously going to repeat the question so don't think i'm nuts hi we're, we're grand So how do you keep your vulnerability and intuition intact? Because it's very important. How do you do that? Oh, just, um, that, that's why I, that, I think I do that by remaining to be humble. I think that's the best way to do it. I think the moment you start working for other stuff, I think when you start making art for money, money or the public accolades or material things, that's when God leaves the room. And then once God is gone, then the vulnerable, it, 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 you're dead. That's it, you're done. And um, it so to answer tired. that question succinctly, I think I keep the vulnerability and intuition intact by means of remaining to be humble and, and, and holding on to my why and remembering why it is that I do what I do, which is just the pure love of, of creating and making art. And, um, and also in, in pursuit of my mother. That's it. Anyone else? We have no questions. Go ahead. Um, have you, I'm not terribly familiar with your work, but have you ever done, um, of course, a Madonna? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have never done a portrait of Donna uh, because I have yet to receive a vision of Donna. That's not true. You're a scaredy cat. Remember, uh, that, remember, that, remember that one time you did a work of me and it was horrifying. I came down and was like, what? It didn't even feel like it was you. I was like, what is this? No, no, that's not true. You did. You did a little sketch. I was like. Well, you waited. You waited to throw me on the bus. But no, no, I, no, to answer your question, I'm the artist here, okay? <laughs> so to answer your question, <laughs> I have never done a work of my wife. Now, I have made works that look like her. I've had, in fact, I had a work recently at the yes. uh, show, my show with the girls in, in New York. Yes, you did. It's called The Dolly and the St. Marks, and there were a number of people, I mean, even including Ashley there, who thought it was, in fact, Donna. She thought it was Donna. She wanted it to be her. So no, it was me. It's not you, babe. It was me. It's not you. Now, that was another question to back to us. So, yeah. I'm doing fine. Uh, Is that Sean Green? What's up, man? <laughs> He's trying to act like we don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs>
<laughs> you trying to act all cool about it. You know you, what's up, Sean? What's happening? How you doing? <laughs> Full incognito. I think people still treat me the same. I think so, Donald. Come on. <laughs> and, uh, this is um, the naivety of Quinn. I think I, I'm being honest. I think people. Okay. <laughs> Ashley. Can we talk to this? We, come on, child, stop. Donna, I think Don't I, throw me under the bus, actually. Yeah. We have these conversations. Wait, wait, no, let's, answer, let's answer this question. Why don't okay. you answer the question? Sorry, so, Sean, repeat it. Sorry, my brain just because I was talking to Miss Ashley. When, when it came to Wall Street, first and especially since having a position at Chelsea, are you actually going to leave that? Oh, I'd love to not answer that one. <laughs> the professional part. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I heard what he said now. I've got no, it. Sorry, everybody else can hear it too. Oh, sorry. What has what <laughs> sorry? What has changed for you professionally and personally since you've been with Gagosian and with how people treat you? Yeah. Okay? Yes. Well, Gagosian are amazing. They are literally the I mean, I, I don't even know how to, to I wanna really be able to ar articulate it. I just think the thing with the dealer is the dealer has to recognise, and please don't take this the wrong way, anybody, the art, without the person who makes the art, there is no art, therefore there is no money. That you don't get a cut of something if the person who makes the art is not happy. The reason Larry and all the lovely, amazing women who work for him, and men, but there's way more amazing women that could go, well, there's amazing men too, I don't want to say anything wrong. <laughs> Me too, but the reason why Ashley and Deborah and all these amazing human beings are so fantastic is that they have a very, very good understanding of that dynamic. And um, that gallery makes that extra 500, not sorry to put you on blast, Gagosian, they make that extra money that they make more than every other dealer for a reason, in my opinion. And I think the service that they give to their artists and the love and the way that they treat them and how much they try to support the artist, to me, is something, oh God, other gallery dealers are gonna get in their feelings. I haven't seen that before, to this level. So I don't wanna be disrespectful to anybody else. I just think my experience with that gallery is that they really understand how to support an artist, and that is my, and I think that without the artist having the support, you don't get the work. The artist has to feel that they're going to get supported in every, in every aspect. And if Quinn phones Ashley or Larry or another person at the gallery and asks for something, it's never a no. It's always a, I'll get back to you or I'm going to get that for you or no problem. And normally, 9.9999 times, it's yes. It's, it's just, there's not really ever really a no. Um, and I think that that is very... Um, that is very pivotal for anybody who's creative. You want to feel supported by the people around you who make everything else happen. Because we see it as a team. We see our working with the galleries as a team. We don't, Quinn doesn't see it as him and the gallery and he's the star. He, doesn't look, he looks at it like him and Ashley and Larry are one and Almin and, and Rona. He sees them all and all the people who work at Gagosian. He sees you, them all as part of his, that we're all together. We're all one. So uh, does that help, Sean? Does that articulate well? And then personally, I think you should answer that. Yeah, well, well this is another question. No, you didn't answer the personal I part. I thought you answered it very well. No, I answered I answered the I answered the business part. That's, that's what I was going to say. No, answer the personal. Did anything change for you personally since being with Gagosian? That's different. Nah, nah, not really, man. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. No, I, I, I'm, nah, not really. Really? Wow, you are really something else. <laughs> oh, my shoes? Yeah, yeah. You know what? <laughs> That's what he's... No, no. Somebody gave me these shoes. It's <laughs> like you. <laughs> go, go ahead, Sarah. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it seems that you set yourself a, a very difficult goal to continue to challenge yourself. At the end of that thing will be the perfect uh, rendering of your mother. Yes. Yeah. You get there, and, and you've done that. What do you do next, then, to continue to challenge yourself? 
That's a very good question. I think. So, it, do you want to repeat the question? Oh, yes, please. Yes, No, Donna, you please. repeat the question, baby. You repeat it. No. You repeat, I repeat. Okay, you, you've set yourself a <laughs> you've set yourself a very high goal. That's right. You render your mother, and then there's a cliff there. So what do you do next? I just start making art. That's it, man. You're never gonna stop making art. Yeah, that's right. I mean, listen to me. If if I could achieve that, I would never. You know how I many scientists around the world be coming to my house, banging on my door. People, can you make a, a work of art about my grandmother bring her back too? Like, <laughs> <laughs> can you bring to my uncle and bring her back? You are the resurrector. Like, this is it. Oh my God. <laughs> I would change the world. But in all seriousness, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, uh, clear, I mean, look, clearly. She's not coming back. I am choosing to live in a very well-constructed fantasy built with the blocks of mourning and loss, a bit of wishful thinking, love, compassion, enduring spirit, clearly. I am choosing to live in this space. I really am. And it's the thing that actually does keep me going, clearly. I mean, intellectually, I know that such is an, is an impossibility. I am not, in fact, going to resurrect this woman from the surface of anybody's canvas. I know this. But I'm not being factual at all. I'm, 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 it's, it's, it's the best way I am able to uh, bring to surface the level of my vulnerability and the deepening of my sadness and how much I miss my mother. That's it. It's the, it's the most articulate way I can put it. So every day I wake up, it's on my mind, you know. My, the, 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 my, the, the word Mary is not on my birth certificate, you know. But it's in my name because it's one of the few ways I have remaining to keep some kind of physical remnant of my mother, you know. Um, and so that's, that's what that is. So there will never be a cliffhanger. Because I'm never going to, it's never going to happen, you know. But, 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 my pursuit of such a goal is as real as the non cliffhanger. You know, it's, it's, that too feels just as real to me. That, you lost me there. But it's like okay, the, you can tell me later, it's fine. That's I'm not going to tell you later. <laughs> as I was saying, the pursuit of, the, of that fantasy is as real as it not being a fantasy. Okay. You know what it. I mean? I'm with you. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Any other questions? Oh, there's a one. The, oh, there's two, two. Jeez. Can you now, repeat that question? You repeat that question. Well, she, she, I think, you know, how is it that we're, we're able to work together? Yeah, I'm in a dual creative relationship. Dual create, creative relationship. I'm an actor and I'm a visual artist. Oh. So seeing you guys work and paint together, mm -hmm. it's just like, it can happen and it doesn't have to be like Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How are we able to work together as a team, as dual creatives, and have this sense of harmony in working? And I can, I, I, I'll say. You go first. <laughs> I think, I, you know what, I think, I think um, marriage is very interesting because I think when you get married, one thing you learn is you learn <laughs> to see yourself and you learn to see your own shortcomings and your own faults and your own issues and problems, and you really do come face to face with the fragility of yourself. Like your wife becomes a mirror reflection of you, right? And so then that means that you have to have the courage and integrity to embrace that reality about yourself. For example, 
I am not good with managing money. Not my thing. I'm not good with managing money. My wife is no doubt one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met. The only other person I know who is probably as smart as Donna is a guy named Elliot Marks. I went to high school with this guy. But Donna is, <laughs> is super, super bright, super smart. And Donna is remarkable when it comes to money management. She manages uh, the taxes, the money, and this and that. And she knows how to move. She's, she's, she has this ability to uh, manage many moving parts at the same time. And she just, she just knows this. She's just so smart. She's brilliant. <laughs> And now, th now, if that was left up to me because I decided to be the man of the house and I should be running the money, we would be broke. <laughs> it's just a fact. We would be broke. And, but that's what I mean that you have, to, you have to remove, you have to relinquish your ego. You can't let your ego get the best of you. If your partner is better at something, your partner should handle that. And if I'm better at something else, then I handle that. I'm good when it comes to organizing the house. I'm good with folding clothes. I'm really good at folding clothes. You know, I'm really good. I pack her luggage. I put the shoes away. I clean. I mop. I'm good with organizing stuff. I'm good with that. But when it comes to money management, business, she, and that's how we respect, that's how we keep the harmony. And I never cross over. We have, we, when we take our walks, some of the things we talk about is, the business of the day. What are we going to do next? What's going on? What's the next step? And I listen to her. I think it's important to be a good listener. I take heed to what she's saying to me. And um, I mean, I would say 90% of my choices in my art career were at the behest of her wisdom. Because she believes in me. She has me at the best interest of her heart. She wants me to succeed. I know this, and, and that's it. She, when she met me, I had nothing. That woman loved me then. She loves me now. If I lost everything tomorrow, she's still going to love me, unless she happens to me. What's that actor? <laughs> yeah, you like to that? <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Set it free. I said it as a joke. Jeez. Let it go. So anyway, in a nutshell, that, that's... <laughs> In a nutshell, that's how I will answer that question. Right, I want to say one thing about that question. I just think that you have to have, um, I think you have to be, I think you have to be really, really aware of your lane. I am not an artist. I don't want to be an artist. My husband is not. I'm not Quinn because I'm married to Quinn. I don't get to walk around being yo, 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 because Quinn's a um, famous artist. I'm not a famous actress. My husband is. I just, I just think those things and knowing your position and really being okay with it and like getting in tune with your own ego, I just think it's really important. And I think a lot of the time people don't, they don't know how to stay in their lane. Ashley is a G at Gagosian. She's a director. She's phenomenal. She's been in the art world for 12 years. She knows, I don't know what I don't know. And I know what I know. You know what I'm saying? So if I don't know something, I phone her, Ashley, Blah, 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 what do you think, girl? Sometimes I phone Shaka King. I'm directing and writing. And do, sometimes I phone Shaka and say, yo, bro, I need to talk to you about something. Because he's higher in the game than me. I don't know what I don't know. I know what I know, right? And I think that what happens is often, especially with creative people, everyone gets a little, I don't know, it's somehow you think because your partner's more famous than you or does better than you, so you feel like it sh should be you. No, it'll be you when it's ready to be you. You feel me? You is you and he is him. And that's, and that's, and I don't, that sounds really simple, but it's a really big issue we have right now, not to like preach suddenly, because of social media. Everyone wants to be a star. Everyone's got their 100,000 followers and thinks they're a superstar. No, where are you and who are you? And love you and where you are. I'm very happy with my path. I'm writing, I, I love what I do. Quinn supports me. He does, he tapes all my auditions. My manager's here, Talitha, and she <laughs> laughed the other day and said to me, God, Quinn was so funny on that tape. I can't even believe you kept a straight face. He does the he does the other characters. He's becoming a good actor right now. You know, <laughs> maybe he's gone. You know what I mean? So I just think stay in your lane and be like, check your ego, right? Just check your ego. You know, maybe I'll be bigger than him one day. Maybe I won't, and that's okay too. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
So that, that would be my tip on yeah, that. Yeah, I think we both understand as well that, well, no, uh, uh, let me put that out there. It's not, it's, it's, I mean, it's not like a perfect match. I mean, we have problems too now. We have fights and arguments. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think at times we got the kind of marriage that could be a show on TV one, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, you know what I'm saying? Like, Rick James type of thing. You know what I mean? It's being crazy. We oh. have crazy journey, roller coaster trip. And I'm, I'm just being <laughs> honest, been wild ride. But I love Ashley and Gordy have got all the tapes. Say what? I said Ashley and Gordy have got all the tapes. Oh yeah, right, right. <laughs> but you know what? I, I I love this woman. She loves me. We we have, we bear through the storms together, and we want to you know achieve things, and uh, we learn to work together. I mean, it's just it's, you know simple as that. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? There was chance? another lady somewhere. There was a this lady in the green shirt. Uh, No, it does not. No. Do you like self Of course I do. I, I think art should, is for the people. This is why I, I enjoy opportunities like this because I try to speak in such a way where it's relatable to the people. There's nobody in this. You know, look, people don't come. You're not come. You know, you don't have a background in art theory, and you don't, and that and that should not be required. It's in a public museum. It's open to the public. That means people from the public coming to the museum. <laughs> so they should have access to the work. That just makes sense, right? So if you come up to me and say, can you explain that work to me? Of course I can. Thank you for seeing my work. I appreciate it. That is, I am honored that you take an interest in my work. Because I, I remember a time when no one did. So I'm grateful for this time now. So I, I really appreciate your question, and you are right. <laughs> Any more? Are we are we uh, are we at the end of the road? <laughs> is that is that is that room for uh, maybe one more question? Yes. I have a little question. Sure. I see it, Deborah. Hey. Actually, it's fearful because it's so incredible and you're so forthcoming. We all feel it. This is more than a art piece. You know, it's incredible in many ways. It's just a little question. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to guess you sleep seven hours. Yep. You got two hours left. <laughs> and I wonder, I think your work maybe really exhausts you and energizes you. Mm -hmm. I wonder, two hours a lot. I mean, are you meditating? Are you recovering? Let me are you repeat the question. Clothes? You're good at that, you said? Yeah. Like, what, how do you have the rest of your life? Because you're actually a very balanced, normal, vigilant, thrilling person. So obviously you're not just filled with people and figuring off in the world. Mm hmm Yes. You work, you know, you make Repeat art. The question. I am going to do oh, it, darling. Sorry. I'm getting there. <laughs> you make, you paint 15 hours a day. Um, you sleep seven. You have two hours left. Mm -hmm. You seem like a very balanced person. What are you doing with those other two hours? Well, when I wake up in the morning, I take a walk with Donna <laughs> before I go to the studio. Okay. As long as I take a walk with my wife, I'm good. I'm with her. And then a lot of times on the walk, I see people in the community. I speak to them, and I'll call my buddy Gardy. I may speak with Richard Beaver, who's a gallery dealer there, you know, Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, or Andre and Mel. We got, you know, and I, but, but then I, we have a coffee, we walk together, we, we, we stand there on Nostra and talk and laugh and catch up. We probably had a fight the night before. I make it up to it the next day. You know, <laughs> we just, and it, and all these things happen. And then from that point, I would, you know, jump in the Uber head to St. Mark's, and resume working on the show for Good Goes in New York. I'm but you saying. also occasionally go to the cinema because you're a big film lover. So sometimes well, you know, since you the pandemic, that's been, that's been cut out because of the pandemic. Yeah, but, but during Deborah's, um, the, the director of Good Goes in Los Angeles, which, who gave Quinn his first, his first show with Good Goes in, was, was under the hand of lovely Deborah. Um, and so f during that time, we could go to cinema. So Quinn, would, Quinn, yeah, goes, go to the movies, Quinn yeah. goes to the movies, you go and buy 
I told you, man, people have given me these things. <laughs> I have a lot of generous, kind people that's giving me these clothes. I'm not buying this. I can't afford this he stuff. Spends I time, kind of he spends time in oh, Margiela. I ain't got that kind of money. I can't afford this stuff. But, 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 but. And then also you spend time talking to, you talk to Ashley a lot. You speak to Gordy, yeah. Andre Mel. Um, and that's it, but, uh, actually. But, uh, uh, and you but, listen to podcasts a lot. You listen yeah, to but, a lot of uh, podcasts. But, but another point to what you're Debra. saying specifically. So let's say an hour or so is, with Donna, I'm in the studio, I work. Now, on occasion, I take walks. He does, on the And I take uh, like an afternoon walk, just walking through the neighborhood. And um, those are the times when I take out to have, like, to show gratitude and be grateful to God. I mean, I, I believe in God. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a... Um, you don't get to church. I'm not a religious person. I do believe in a higher power. And I take walks, and I like to say to myself, I like to think that I'm having a sermon with nature. You know, I take stock in the small things. You know, I look at trees, or I just stare at the grass, or I look at the architecture of the buildings, and I like taking that time out because I am really, and I, I want to make this very, very clear. I, I am truly, I really am truly grateful that I am a, full-time artist, and I'm living inside the dream that I once had as a kid. So that's why I take those walks, and I say, thank you, God. Thank you. It didn't have to work out this way. It, this this could have ended in a very different way. I was, you know, most people are like three or four decisions away from being on the other side of that fence. Because I, I, cause that's the thing about energy. Energy is not prejudice. It doesn't care about your interests. It doesn't care about your history. Energy is just energy. Mm. When I was a teacher for at-risk youth, there was a young man who was committing crimes. And his crimes began to evolve. He kept getting caught with the police. But he was persistent, never gave up. He kept at it. And I said to him, one day you're going to make it to the big time, baby. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, the big time, man, you're going to make it. You keep this up and keep striving and keep pushing and, and, and you never quit and you keep that faith and you stay steadfast, you're going to make it to the big time, man. You're going to really achieve your dreams. And before you know it, you got 15 years in prison. The big time. That's right. But energy doesn't care. So the same is true on the opposite end. If you keep pursuing your dream as an actor or a writer or an artist and you keep at it and you stay steadfast, you're going to make it to the big time too. He's doing 15 years in prison, you're going to do 15 years in that gallery. You're going to do 15 years in that uh, writer's room. You're going to do 15 years on that film set. You're going to make it as well, just like he did. Because energy, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, because energy doesn't care. It's real. And when I take my walks and meditate and give thanks to God, that's what I think about. And that's what keeps me balanced and ebullient. What does that mean? That's what she said. Thank you.